Yaristan, your letters inhibit me. No, I'm no longer angry. I'm frustrated. For 20 years, I longed to tell you about myself, if not in letters, then in a novel which was addressed to you, even if it never reached you. I wanted to tell you about my life because I thought I had lived up to what you might have wanted me to be. I looked at myself through what I took to be your eyes, and I wasn't ashamed. I was, in fact, somewhat proud of myself. Not altogether. I hadn't taken part in the overthrow of the ruling system, but I hadn't succumbed to it either. I hadn't emerged unscathed, but I wasn't destroyed either. Unlike Louisa, I hadn't sold my productive energy. Unlike Sabina, I hadn't sold either my body or my soul. Until your letters challenged my self-evaluation, I thought I had done rather well. My activity on that university newspaper staff was one of the high points of my story. I saw it as a continuation of activity I had once shared with you. Yet now that I can finally tell you about my little victories, I feel embarrassed and inhibited. I can't help seeing myself through the lens that you're now wearing, and I look ludicrous to myself. The very words with which I would have boasted about my activity are the words with which you ridicule it. If my desire to communicate and defend my insights and past experiences was pedagogy, then it was precisely the opportunity to engage in this pedagogy that attracted me to the newspaper staff. I think you go too far when you characterize every instance of such activity as an attempt to convert people to a religion. I understand the way your analysis applies to Len, Rhea, and Alec. I recognize them as missionaries of a repressive religion. I can even see how your analysis applies to certain aspects of Luisa's relation to the world. But I don't see how your analysis applies to me. To communicate a religion, you need to have certainties, and I never had any. At most, I had past friends and experiences, but the answers those friends and experiences gave me in any given context were never clear. Even if I granted that your description of me was valid down to your characterization of my pedagogical activity as a time of missionary activity, I still wouldn't see that I had chosen the worst of the alternatives available to me. In retrospect, I'm still convinced that under the circumstances, I did rather well, since I know what other alternatives were available to me. I've had a few chances to sample Luisa's as well as Sabina's alternatives. I might in time have reconciled myself to Luisa's situation, but I couldn't have retained the amount of energy she has managed to keep alive. I could never have been Sabina. I wouldn't have survived either physically or psychologically. In a way, it's ironic that you describe the activity I chose as a type of religious activity. I visited Luisa soon after I started to work on the newspaper. She had just been called to testify in an official inquisition. She was asked where she was from, what she had done, what she thought. Later, she learned that the inquisition didn't concern her, but George Alberts. His turn had come to undergo the treatment to which he had subjected Debbie Matthews. George Albert, the person I'd always regarded as a model opportunist, was called a subversive and fired from his teaching job. Don't shed tears for him, though. He immediately opened up some kind of research organization connected to the military, and he again sold his talents to the same government that had just fired him. When Louisa told me about that, I had the feeling that I was among the pitifully few people who were engaged in a struggle against the state religion and its inquisition. I saw myself as an atheist during a witch hunt, aimed not only at people playing at being revolutionaries, but even at totally unprincipled individuals like Alberts, who had once in their lives been swept along by a revolutionary upsurge. Some of my newspaper friends were devoted to a counter-religion as repressive as the religion we fought against, and they tried to convert me. Lem's, and to a smaller extent, Alec's goal was to convert all the students of the university to their form of state worship. But my approach, influenced by Louisa and by my experiences with you, was significantly different from theirs. I don't think you can really characterize as religious. Unlike Lem and Alec, I didn't write articles about fired professors in order to prove that they wouldn't have been fired if the counter-revolution prevailed. I knew perfectly well that the professors would never have been hired in the first place if that religion prevailed. My sole aim was to describe the militaristic lectures, the banning of speakers, the firing of professors, and to let readers draw their own conclusions from the facts themselves. To me, reality itself was so scandalous that I was sure numerous students would act as soon as they knew what the facts were. I was wrong, but not altogether. Several years later, a large number of students did in fact respond to the scandal. That movement is today being drowned by variants of the religion then carried by Rhea and Lem. I didn't only resist Rhea and Len's attempts to recruit and use me. By resisting them, I helped mess up their other plans and ruin their minuscule organization. The editor of the campus newspaper, Hugh Narava, was a very mild-mannered, very middle-class student. I was immediately fascinated by him. The words he used most frequently were responsible and fair. He seemed convinced that there were always two, and never more than two, sides to every question. The task of the responsible editor was to be fair to each of the two sides. 
Once Alec wrote an article on some students who had refused to swear to be loyal to the state. They were forced to march in a military parade in their street clothes. They looked ridiculous, even to their own friends, and everyone laughed at them. Hugh went out of his way to give equal space to the other half of the question. He interviewed a military professor and published alongside Alex's article an equally long article depicting the dangerous and all-pervasive enemy against whose imminent invasion the uniformed students were protecting civilization. One time I wrote an article about a pacifist who was to speak in a university lecture hall but who was denied permission to speak in the hall just before the event was scheduled to take place. For the sake of fairness, Hugh telephoned the university's administration, and alongside my article, he published the administration's official statement that it was the university's policy never to prevent anyone from speaking on campus, since free speech was an indispensable condition for education. The fact that one article flatly con contradicted the other didn't prove to Hugh that one of them had to be false. It convinced him that the truth lay somewhere between the two extremes. The person on the next rung of the newspaper hierarchy was Bess Locke. She was the managing editor. She was the only person on the staff besides me who didn't have a middle-class background. I learned that her mother worked as a cleaning woman for people who were managers in the plant where Louisa worked. Her father had run off when she was a baby. Yet although she was even more proletarian than I, neither Lem nor Alec took the slightest interest in her. It was impossible to communicate with her. She was literally a machine. I'm sure she was the best managing editor that newspaper had had before or since. She read, measured, counted with the speed and precision of a computer. But whenever she opened her mouth, she articulated a law. Don't, can't, not allowed, against regulations, appeared in every statement she made. She had internalized all the written and unwritten codes of the state, the university, and while he was the editor, she internalized the codes of fairness and responsibility as well. Bess and Hugh went with each other when I met them. I can't imagine what they could have said to each other, and I never asked him. Perhaps by enumerating the regulations, she familiarized Hugh with his responsibilities. I have to admit, I wasn't able to muster up any solidarity toward my fellow worker, Bess. The most bizarre member of the newspaper staff was Thurston Rockshaws. He came from the very top of the social hierarchy, and I'm sure that's where he is again today. He considered himself superior to the rest of us in wit, knowledge, as well as looks. He thought himself a humorist. He wrote a regular joke column, which is in fact very clever, and occasionally he wrote an article. I laughed whenever he said anything at all. He thought I appreciated his brilliant sense of humor. In fact, I laughed at him. I thought his poses were ludicrous and hilarious. I had never been so close to a real dilettante, a genuine heir to the wealth wrenched from the labor of millions of wage workers. He never saw through me. Genuinely convinced that my laughter expressed appreciation of his wit, one day he asked me to accompany him to a dance which was going to take place several weeks later. I accepted his invitation immediately. In a flash, I figured out this was my chance to slip away from the unwanted attentions of Lem as well as Rhea. I made it a point of announcing to everyone on the staff that I had accepted Thurston's invitation to the dance. My strategy was completely successful, but in ways I hadn't expected at all. When I told Rhea, she said, I guess I overestimated your class consciousness. That put an end to her admiration for her proletarian roommate. She never again asked me about the educational background of my family, and she never again asked me to join her organization. Lem caught me late one afternoon when I was alone in the newspaper office typing an article. He sat down next to me and started to cry. Are you actually going to go through with that, he said. With what, Lem, I asked innocently. Are you going to go out with that reactionary, that exploiter of the working class, he asked. He's really a wonderful person when you get to know him, Lem, I lied. In Lem's eyes, I was lost. My strategy was an instant success. From that day on, I no longer had a private missionary trailing me like a shadow. Lem retreated to Debbie Matthews and to his organizational meetings. What took me completely by surprise was Alec's response to my insincere flirtation with Thurston. Alec was jealous. He hatched a plot to save me from the claws of the dangerous reactionary, and in the process of working out his exquisitely designed plot, he threw all of his political commitments overboard, spoiled the plans and projects of his organization, and created absolute chaos in the newspaper staff. Alec didn't confront me with the problem directly. In fact, he took such a roundabout approach that I didn't figure out what he had done until several months later. His strategy was brilliant, and like all brilliant strategies, it led to completely unexpected consequences. He began by breaking up his relationship with Rhea. He told her he was disillusioned with the organization and tore up his membership card in her presence. Rhea blamed me. She accused me of brainwashing him with reactionary arguments. I argued from the bottom of my heart that I had nothing to do with Alec's disillusionment. 
I felt sorry for her. Little did I know then the place I occupied in Alex's scheme. When I began to figure it out, I silently moved into another room. Alex's defection from the organization and my deficiency as a rank-and-file leader left Lem isolated on the newspaper staff. To remedy this, Rhea herself joined the staff. After breaking up with Rhea, Alec formed a clique with Minnie Vock and Damon Hesper, the remaining two regular members of the newspaper staff. Minnie and Damon were members of a political sect which was indistinguishable from Lem's organization in terms of its internal relationships, but which considered Lem's and Rhea's organizations the main evil that plagued humanity. I actually agreed with much of what they said. Many of their views even had a superficial similarity to views you've expressed in your letters. For example, they held that an organization of professional revolutionaries which claimed to liberate the workers would only enslave them. They held that the workers' revolution could only be led by the workers themselves. What I couldn't understand then and still can't now is how they viewed their own sect. They never tired of telling me that the role of their organization was not to lead the workers but to educate them. It never seemed to occur to them that if the teacher is the one who leads, the student the one who follows. Alec's resignation from Lem's and Rhea's sect was a precondition for his alliance with Minnie and Damon. If I refer to Minnie and Damon as a single person, it's because at that time they were like Siamese twins. Minnie formulated the arguments, and Damon merely emphasized them. Alec had a long talk with Minnie and Damon a few days after he broke up with Rhea. He told them that he had finally been convinced by their arguments and had quit his organization. He proved this by showing them his torn membership card. He even attended a few meetings of their organization, although he later told me he didn't agree with their organizational practices at all. As soon as he gained their trust, the three began to plan a series of articles which would systematically expose the bias of the education, the extent to which militarist and state officials dominated the university's policies, the cowardice of the administrators and professors, the apathy of students. Every day, one of them submitted exposures of the military curriculum, articles on fired professors, interviews with pacifists. Hugh couldn't possibly keep up with the other side of all the questions raised in their articles. Consequently, there was a lively confrontation in the newspaper office almost every day. Bess and Thurston argued that if the other side weren't given equal space, the paper would become a propaganda sheet and that consequently the articles of Minnie, Damon, or Alec should be suppressed whenever a rejoinder couldn't be published with them. Hugh's position wasn't as clear as that. Committed though he was to publishing two sides to every question, he had yet another principle. No article should ever be suppressed. Since he couldn't resolve the conflict between his two principles, he would put the question to a staff vote. At first, the result of the voting was that Minnie, Damon, and Alec outnumbered Bess and Thurston because Hugh, Rhea, Lem, and I abstained. As a result, all their articles were published. The reason Lem and Rhea abstained was that they refused to be on the same side as Minnie, Damon, and the renegade, Alec. I abstained because, although I favored including the articles without views of the other side, my vote wasn't needed for their inclusion. But this state of affairs didn't last. On one occasion, Minnie wrote an article which contained a critique of Lem's and Rhea's organization. From that day on, both Rhea and Lem formed a ludicrous block with Tess and Thurston and voted against the inclusion of every article written by Alec, Minnie, or Damon, who were outnumbered four to three. I was forced to take sides. Of course, I voted in favor of including every article without a rebuttal, and as a result, there was a tie. Four in favor and four against. Tempers rose and clicks hardened. After one particularly heated exchange, which took place only a few days before the dance to which I was to accompany Thurston, he very politely told me he would prefer not to go with me. I was relieved. Alec had known that sooner or later I'd take sides, and at that point I'd clash with Thurston. I was no longer inhibited from openly joining the clique. But the ultimate decision as to whether or not to include the articles again depended on Hugh. He once again found a way to be fair to each of the two sides, he voted with us one day and against us the next so that nearly every other one of our articles was suppressed. In spite of the exclusion of almost half our articles, I felt that my new friends and I were engaged in a virtual crusade to expose the repressive atmosphere of the university. My acceptance of my new friends wasn't unqualified. I rarely argued with Minnie and Damon. They were infinitely better informed than I, and the convoluted sentences in which they couched their arguments intimidated me. Yet despite their erudition and their rhetorical talents, I saw through their outlook. I thought it was a superficial version of Louisa's. Their affirmation that working people were perfectly capable of running their own affairs seemed to be a mere slogan that neither Minnie nor Damon really believed. 
The workers' ability to run their own affairs seemed to depend on their ability to learn this from Minnie and Damon's organization. And they were convinced, believe it or not, that their sect had discovered that workers were able to run their own affairs, that their sect had discovered workers' councils, and that their sect had discovered the reactionary character of the role of revolutionary politicians. Nachello, Margarita, and Luisa had learned all this from experiences they had lived. This knowledge had flowed in their blood. They had learned from painful counter-revolutionary wars how revolutionary politicians transformed the workers' movement into a gang of government bureaucrats. To Minnie and Damon, these painful experiences were nothing but phrases discovered by their sect only yesterday and not yet applied to their relationships with each other within their organization. I couldn't respect them, but I did enjoy muckraking with them. I accepted Alec with fewer misgivings. He was politically unformed. He had joined Rhea's sect for the same reason you said Manuel had joined his organization. Alec had been Rhea's boyfriend and had followed her into the organization on a date. When he became interested in me, he abandoned Rhea as well as the entire credo of her organization. After he left the organization, he worked at a political potpourri consisting of minis and my observations, couched in phrases he had retained from his earlier commitment. Alec had nothing at all in common with you or Jan Sedlak or Ron Matthews, but in spite of his naivete, perhaps because of it, I liked him a lot. One night, a few weeks after I moved out of Rhea's room, Sabina surprised me with a visit. She burst into my room at the co-op late at night. Alec had just brought me home. He and I had taken the paper to the printers that night. We had done all the last-minute proofreading of galleys and shortening of articles. Sabina had waited outside for Alec to leave. I was dead tired and my head was filled with the day's events. Minnie had submitted a very long interview with the campus general, who had boastfully showed her the files he kept on all the students in the university. He classified students in terms of their degree of patriotism, from loyal to apathetic, disloyal, dangerous, and subversive. The article was one of the biggest exposures of the year. Hugh had voted with the four of us to include the article. I wasn't glad to see Sabina that night. I knew that I had turned against her and Ron long before they had left me standing next to their bicycles. I knew that my hostility towards Sabina and Ron had been only partly motivated by the fact they hadn't trusted me at the time of the robbery. I knew that I had rejected Ron even before our excursion to the beach in the car Ron wrecked. This was very clear to me when I saw Sabina that night, because I was then in the midst of the activities and friends I had hoped to find when I had first turned against Ron. It was clear to me that I had rejected Ron already when our relationship was at its peak, at the time of our earliest bicycle excursions. Ron had known that as early as I had. It had been as obvious to him as to me that he could no more take my path than I his. He would have suffocated in an atmosphere of petty quarrels couched in erudite language. He couldn't have fought his battles on that terrain. Yes, Yarastan, I knew how early I had made the choice you describe. It wasn't Ron's terrain or Sabina's, but I knew it was mine. It wasn't all petty quarrels. By that night, I had already fought some meaningful battles. I don't want to exaggerate their significance, but I'm certain they were far more meaningful than any battles I could have fought on Ron's terrain. As I studied Sabina, wondering why she had come, I didn't regret having rejected their path. I couldn't imagine anything socially relevant growing out of stolen cars. This was the only time I saw Sabina until I was expelled from college. The following morning, I remembered her visit as a bad dream. Sabina spoke like a robot. She looked past me and seemed not to care whether or not I heard her. Ron is dead. Dead? How? When? You and George Alberts are responsible, she droned. I thought her coldness and her seeming indifference were symptoms of hysteria. I paid no attention to the accusation. I repeated my questions. Missing in action, she answered. They didn't say when or how. But when did he join the army, I asked with disbelief. Air Force. He signed up because of you, she told me without raising her voice, without seeming to be aware that she was telling me anything extraordinary. Sabina, I shouted, I don't understand. I burst into tears. I didn't think you would, but I thought you ought to know. Saying that, she left as abruptly as she'd come. I cried, uncomprehending, until I fell asleep without undressing or washing. The next morning, Alec's knock on the door woke me. He was annoyed. What's the matter with you? he asked. This is a hell of a day to oversleep. We had intended to rush to the boxes where the papers were distributed so as to see how students responded to Minnie's article. We spent the day interviewing students who were willing to express their responses to the article. Sabina's visit and Ron's death receded in my memory. You're absolutely right, I admit to Sabina. By the time of Ron's trial, I had already made my choice. 
I'd walked out on Ron. But why did you say I was responsible when you came to tell me Ron was dead? You and George Alberts were responsible, Sabina said, in the same tone she had used 14 years earlier. How can you repeat that accusation today, I asked her. When you said it that night you visited me at the co-op, I thought you were hysterical. Ron had left you and he'd just been killed in the war. Ron never left me, she said. He left you. And he wasn't killed in the war. Would you stop being so cryptic and mysterious, I shout. What you're saying doesn't mean anything to me. Tina asked me, are you sure it was Sabina who was hysterical that night? What the hell do, we, do you know about it, I asked Tina. You were only four years old at the time. I know a hell of a lot more about it than you do, Tina proclaims. First of all, I was almost five. And secondly, Jose told me about his last days with Ron at least a dozen times before you came to the garage. You were always the villain of his story. I thought of you along with George Alberts and Tom Matthews as the bad people of this world. If you knew so much, why didn't you tell me after you left the garage, I asked her. Are you kidding? You were about as interested in Ron as Louisa is, Tina says. Whenever I mentioned Ron, you went into your professional pose. Oh, really? What else did he steal? Louisa contributes. What else was there to tell about him? Nothing, I say to her. Absolutely nothing. So why should Sophia have wanted to hear about Ron, Louisa asked Tina. I answer, because I want to hear about him now, that's why. I want to know what it was that Tina knew about Ron during all these years. The day Ron got out of reform school, Jose and Sabina went to get him, Tina begins. Instead of being glad to see his two best friends, Ron got into the car and asked, where's Sophie? I asked Sabina, is Tina making that up? Sabina shakes her head. Jose thought Ron was joking, Tina continues. He asked Ron who the hell Sophie was. Then he got mad at Ron for expecting someone else to have come for him instead. But he saw tears in Ron's eyes and asked Sabina who else Ron was expecting. Sabina told him you hadn't known when Ron was supposed to be released. You never told me anything about that, I say to Sabina. Sabina answers, we visited you after Ron was released, and all you said was, really? Ron hardly said a word to me that night, I insist. You did all the talking. He seemed to be from a different world. Different from whose, Sabina asks. Mine, from mine, I answer angrily. You're so right. Have you ever been wrong, Sabina, about anything? Tina continues. Jose said Ron changed after he and Sabina visited you. Jose thought that it was then that Ron decided there were two or three more things he wanted to do in his life before he was through. It always looks like that after a person is dead, I tell her. The last thing a person does always looks like the last things he had intended to do. Jose hadn't just met Ron, you know, Tina exclaims. He had that feeling before Ron died, not after. I know how long Jose had known Ron, I admit. Tom and Debbie Matthews had adopted Jose during the Depression. It was mainly Jose who brought up Ron when both Tom and Debbie had jobs during the war. Some years after the war, Tom accused Jose of teaching Ron to be a criminal. Jose angrily left the Matthews and didn't see them again until Ron's trial. Tina continues, The first thing Ron wanted to do after visiting you was to find Ted, who had left reform school some months before Ron. To start the garage, stolen parts at cut rates and heroin for the health of the poorer folk, I say sarcastically. But you're just like Louisa, Tina says to me. I'm sorry, I tell her. Please go on. Ron and Jose looked for Ted because he was good at stealing cars, Tina says. Ever since the trial, one idea had been on both their minds, to get even with Tom Matthews. Ron had wanted you to be in on the revenge. That's why he and Sabino visited you. To take part in revenge, Louisa asks. Is that the act of the individual rebellion the Yaristan praises in his letters? Tina disregards Louisa's interruption and continues, Tom Matthews had bought a brand new car right after the trial. He would park it right in front of his diner, and he'd spend half the day looking through the window to see if it was still there. Jose, Ron, and Ted drove off with it in broad daylight a couple of seconds after he had just looked at it, and probably a couple seconds before he had looked at it again and saw that it was gone. The first comment Ron made when they drove off was, I bet Sophie would have loved to see the old man's face when he saw that car gone. I'd give my right arm to hear what she'd have said. If she could only have stood across the street and watched his expression, this would have been perfect. Good grief, Louisa yells. Why you? I answer, because Ron's old man almost shot me the night Ron took me to his house. Yes, Ron was right. I really would have liked to see that old man's face. Tina continues, they drove it away and dismantled it so completely that Matthews himself couldn't have recognized his new car if he had walked into the garage and looked right at it. He went out of his mind when he saw that his new car was gone. He hunted for Ron all over the city. One day he even came to our house. Albert's house, Sabina corrects. He came with a gun looking for Ron. He would have shot Sabina if I hadn't screamed, Tina said proudly. Do you remember that, Sabina asks. 
I almost remember, Tina says. Anyway, I thought I remembered when you first told me about it. You laughed at him. You told him that Ron had just become a professional killer, Sabina said, and that he'd drop a bomb on Matthew's house. Matthews went wild, Tina continues. He waved his gun in Sabina's face. He waved it at me when I screamed, and then he ran out of the house. You had some nerve to laugh at him when he was in such a state, I tell Sabina. He could have killed both of you. We're both still here, though, Tina says. Matthews closed his diner during all the weeks he spent looking for Ron. When he opened the diner again, hardly any of his former customers returned. Most of them went to a franchise restaurant across the street, which hadn't done very well until Matthews closed down. At the end of that month, Matthews didn't have enough money to pay all his bills. A few months later, he was bankrupt. His diner was auctioned off. Couldn't Debbie get some kind of job? I asked. I was with you once when we saw what a state she was in, Tina reminds me. Jose told me she had been something of a drunkard ever since she'd been thrown out of her union job after the war. When she lost her teaching job, she was drunk all the time. Matthews tried to get a factory job. He did get some low-paying job, but was fired after a few weeks. Maybe it was just a temporary job. Jose never told me the details. What Debbie told Jose was that one day she heard a shot. She dragged herself to the basement. Matthews was lying on the floor. He had shot himself. Louisa mutters almost to herself. He was murdered by his own son. Oh, shit, Sabina explains. I object, too. That wasn't exactly what Tina said. I didn't say he shot himself because his new car was stolen, Tina explains. That's only part of the reason. I add, Debbie's drunkenness must have had something to do with it. Several years earlier, Ron had told me how bitter she'd been about being thrown out of the union she'd helped build. I can understand why she broke down when that happened to her a second time. I still remember the hatred with which she looked at me at Ron's trial because she thought I was George Albert's daughter. Do you see any connections yet? S Sabina asked Louisa. Don't you know why you and Sophia and I got out of jail two days after being arrested and why our immigration was so easy? I don't see what that has to do with it, Louisa says. Why do you think he had a job waiting for him as well as a house for the three of us when we got here, Sabina asks her, immediately answering her own question. Albert saved your skin by selling his soul. Debbie Matthews was only one of his victims. When Debbie fell, she drove the sinking Tom Matthews all the way to the bottom. You came here on the devil's pay, Louisa. Louisa objects. If you're suggesting I was implicated in that man's suicide, you're completely deranged. Your reasoning is as distorted as Yara stands. I'm not suggesting anything, Sabina said. I'm only stating facts. All right, you've made that point, I concede to Sabina. But you still haven't told me what I had to do with Ron's death. Haven't we? she asks. No, you haven't, I insist. I don't know any more now than I did the night you came to my room at the university co-op. You shouted I, that I was responsible for Ron's death. I didn't shout, Sabina says. And I said you and Albert's. I get impatient. Would you mind explaining that, Sabina? I don't care how long it takes. Noticing Louisa's pained expression, I tell Sabina, I don't care whether Louisa stays or leaves. Now that you've unearthed the details of my relationship to Ron, I'd like to hear all of it. And please don't ask me what good it'll do to tell me. Louisa leans back on the couch, yawns and closes her eyes so as to communicate to all of us that she's not interested in the details of my relations with Ron. The day before I went to see you at the university, Sabina begins. Debbie Matthews shows up at Albert's house. I was alone with Tina. Debbie collapsed into an armchair the moment she walked in. She was stone drunk. You hussy, she told me. Why did you walk out on my son when he needed you? Where's that filthy father of yours? Where's that son of a bitch Albert's? I asked her what happened and why she wanted Albert's. She said, I want to see his face now that they've thrown his ass out of school. I want to see what he looks like now that he's gotten what he gave me. I want to ask him if he's happy now about himself and me. Where the hell is that slimy bastard that called himself my friend and then cut me up one limb at a time? I told her Alberts was working and asked if there was something that had happened to Ron. She said, he's working. He can't be working, dearie. He's off in some bar. He got booted out like I was. He's not allowed to work. He's a subversive. I described the work he was doing and Debbie got hysterical. That bastard is doing research for the Air Force, she asked. Then she shouted, that low, unprincipled bastard, the Air Force. He's working for the outfit that killed my son. I had been afraid that was the news she'd come with. She worked herself up into a frenzy about the fact that Alberts was already employed again. She walked around the house, knocked down chairs, and threw books on the floor. She yelled, what are you people? Who sent you? You're some kind of agents. You were sent to get rid of us. Well, kill me right here. Get it over with. 
Then she collapsed on the floor. I couldn't tell if she was asleep or dead. I set a pillow under her head, put a blanket over her, and ran to the garage. Fortunately, Jose was there. Tina tells me, that was when they found out where you fit in. What do you mean, I asked her. Tina says, when Jose got to know you years later, he often said, she's as innocent as a baby that started a fire that burned down a city. I become impatient. Tina, what the hell are you talking about? Jose told me never to tell you, Tina claims. Sabina says to Tina, go ahead and tell her. There's nothing left to tell that she doesn't already know. Jose said you'd have become a completely different person if you'd known the truth, Tina tells me. Exasperated, I ask, the truth about what? Aren't you confusing Jose with Yaristan? The truth about you and Ron, Tina says. Jose often told me he wouldn't have liked what you would have become if you'd known. That's exactly the opposite of what Yaristan says. Tina, don't play Sabina's games with me, I shout. Tina calmly muses, I wonder if it would really have made any difference if you'd known. I grab her by the shoulders and shake her, shouted, Don't dangle a string, Tina. I'm not a cat. Tina shouts back, That's what Jose said about you. You kept dangling a string in front of Ron and he kept jumping at it. Only you never knew you were dangling it. My patience wears out. Go to hell, Tina. If this is another one of your jokes, you can shove it up your ass because I'm going to sleep. This one doesn't have a funny ending, Sophia, she says. And I'd just as soon not tell you about it, so if you want to go to sleep, that's fine with me. I'm sleepy as hell. I plead with Tina. What is it you'd just as soon not tell me? What you've been asking about for the past two hours, Sophia, your connection to Ron's death. How can you know anything about that, I asked her. It turned out that Debbie Matthews was the only one who knew anything about it. When she told Jose and Sabina, all they could say was, my God. I turned to Sabina. You never breathed a word to me about what Debbie told you. Sabina says, I told you everything that night when I visited you at the co-op. You didn't ask me to go into details, and in any case, it was too late to do anything about it. Tina adds, Ron was already dead. All you told me was that I was responsible for Ron's death, I say again. This time it's Tina who says, you and George Alberts. She continues, that was really a very complete summary, and if it was too late to tell you the details then, it's way too late now. I have to be at work in four hours, and we should carry Louisa to bed. Don't worry about Louisa, I insist. Nothing wakes her once she's asleep. Please, Tina, I want to hear those details now. Go to sleep on your job. Don't keep repeating that Sabina told you that you were responsible for Ron's death, Tina tells me. Albert's role was much more important to Sabina than yours. We were still living in his house when she learned about it. Didn't you know what Sabina thought of Albert's then? Sabina asked Tina, Would you mind leaving that out? If I'm going to lose any night's sleep telling her, Tina says, I'll at least tell her everything I know. I'm sure she'll never learn that part from you. Tina turns towards me. Jose told me he and Sabina were both stunned when they heard what Debbie had to say, but they were stunned for different reasons. Every time Jose said, my God, because of something Debbie said about you, Sabina said it because of something she said about Albert's. Sabina didn't tell you about your role because that wasn't what mattered to her, and she had in any case learned most of that before from Ron. What mattered to her was what she learned about her life's hero. All that math and physics she had learned from him ever since she was a little girl, all those laboratory experiments which she thought revealed the secrets of the universe, she had never connected any of that with the slaughter of thousands of human beings. Debbie uprooted all of Sabina's admiration for Alberts. She gave Sabina a picture of a cold-blooded murderer of thousands and maybe even millions of people. And not only a murderer, but the worst kind, the one who doesn't kill a single opponent in face-to-face -face combat, but who exterminates unseen victims from the safety of his laboratory. Sabina went completely wild. She left Jose at Debbie's and ran to Albert's house. She completely destroyed the lab he'd built for her on the second floor. She took all the books he'd ever given her and threw them into the incinerator. She burned all her clothes, all of mine, all my toys, everything. The clothes she was wearing were the only things she took with her. She'd even have burned his house. My God, I exclaimed. Sabina blurted it all out once, years later, only because she was completely stoned. The day after she told us she tried to convince us she'd lied to us. She never again got stoned after that. Jose didn't know any of this had happened at the time. He only knew that Sabina had decided to move into the garage with him, Ted, and Tissy. She hasn't once seen Albert since then. Sabina was calmer the day after she moved out of Albert's house, when she visited you. She went to tell you Ron was dead, and that was all she intended to tell you. She thought you ought to know. She probably hadn't paid much attention to what Debbie had said about you. It was Jose who heard that. I begged Tina, would you mind being a little more coherent? I know you can do it. Tina is offended. You 
you have to be sarcastic. This is the first time I've ever pieced the whole story together from the bits and snatches dropped by you, Sabina, and Jose. I've never before realized what all those pieces added up to. I try to apologize. I didn't mean to be sarcastic. I got lost, that's all. Tinas turns to Sabina and asks, Why don't you tell her? You were there too. I only know these things at second hand. Sabina says, Just you go ahead, Tina. You're doing fine. Don't you be sarcastic too, Tina tells her. I'm sorry it's so confusing, Sophia. It's awfully late. Why don't you get Sabina to tell you these things some other time? I object. You told me those things were precisely the things that didn't matter to her. Besides, I want to hear it now and from you. Sabina would only confuse me even more. Tina says, I'll try to tell it in order. Sabina already told you Debbie had gone to look for Alberts. That happened the day before Sabina visited you at the university co-op. Debbie was drunk and collapsed on the couch. Sabina ran to get Jose. She wanted to get Debbie out of Albert's house before he returned. She got Jose to help her drag Debbie to Jose's car and drive her home. They both sat by her bed while she slept for several hours. She was relatively sober when she woke up. Jose gave her coffee. Pointing her finger at Sabina, Debbie said to Jose, Keep away from that snake, kid. She'll stab you in the back. Jose asked what Sabina had done. That's when Debbie blurted out the whole story. Her finger hadn't been pointed at Sabina, but at you. I start to feel sick. Tina continues, she thought Sabina was the girl Tom Matthews had tried to shoot the night that Ron tried to take you to his room. She didn't see me that night. Debbie and I didn't meet until Ron's trial, I tell Tina, but Lem introduced me to her at the trial. She couldn't have thought Sabina and I were the same person since we were both at the trial. She didn't know you had anything to do with Ron when she saw you at the trial, Tina tells me. What story did she blurt out, I asked Tina. When Jose asked her what she had against Sabina... Debbie said she'd visited Ron in reform school after the trial. Ron told her that as soon as he got out, he'd get even with Matthews. Debbie said she didn't blame Ron because Tom Matthews was a bastard who jailed his own son. Ron told her he wasn't going to get even with him about that. He had expected that. He wanted to get even with Matthews for breaking up Ron's relationship with his girl. Ron told Debbie that when Matthews tried to shoot you, he had scared the shit out of you and you had changed as a result. You'd become afraid of Ron. If Ron said that, he was lying to himself, I tell Tina. Our relationship was already over when Matthews threatened us with his gun. Ron met Sabina the very next day. Sabina, trying to imitate Ron, says, Oh shit, Sabina, you know it's Sophie I want, but she thinks I'm someone else, someone she must have known someplace else. When did he tell you that, I asked Sabina. A week after he moved in with me, she said. So soon after the car wreck, I exclaim, I turn to Tina and ask her, Is that true? Now how in the world would I know that, Sophia? You seem to know everything else. Tina says, I know that when Sabina and Jose got Ron the day he was... Tina says, I know that when Sabina and Jose got Ron the day he was released from reform school. I interrupt. He asked why I wasn't there. I already know that. Sabina says, right after his release from reform school, you and Ron got me up at midnight. I interrupt again. Ron was as talkative as a mummy. He talked to you, Sabina says. You mean at the beginning? I tried to joke with him. What did you say? Sabina asks. Just trivialities, I say. I reminded him of our first meeting. Your words? She asks. I said I'd meet him any time, I admit. You said that to him? Tina asks. Jose was right. You really did dangle a string in front of him. Jose th said that before and after they drove off with Matthew's car, Ron kept mumbling, she'll meet me any time. I couldn't have joined him in the Air Force, I exclaim. Ron didn't mean the Air Force, Tina tells me. He thought the garage idea would appeal to you. If it didn't, he was ready to leave the city with you after Matthew's car was stolen. Leave and do what, I ask. Go traveling, stealing and camping, I suppose, she says. He was crazy. I'd never agree to do that, I exclaim. Tina said, that's what Sabina told Ron. She told him he was crazy, that you were set on becoming a professor. I bite my lip until it bleeds. Would I have joined Ron if I had known? Sabina told Ron you'd gladly meet him any time, but not any place. She told him you'd meet him in college. Tina adds, and Ron must have known Sabina was right. That's why he joined the Air Force. What do you mean, that's why he joined the Air Force? I ask her. Couldn't he have done thousands of other things? Did he have to become a killer for the state? Maybe he thought he'd communicate something to you by doing that. Are you suggesting he joined the Air Force because he knew I'd hate him for it? I ask her. I don't know, she answers. Ask Sabina. Sabina said revenge was always important to him. Tina continues. I was telling you what Debbie told Jose after he asked her what she had against Sabina. She told about her conversation with Ron in reform school. 
Then she got out of bed and showed Jose a letter she had gotten from Ron only a few months before he was killed. Jose kept the letter. Once I saw him reading it and crying, I saw the letter. It said, Dear Mom, I didn't want you to think I came out here because of you, or even because of the old man. All that got balanced out. I came out here to balance out some other things that had nothing to do with you, but I can't go through with what they're doing out here. Your loving son, Ron. He didn't kill himself, I exclaimed. Several months later, Debbie was informed that he was missing in action, Tina tells me. Why, I asked. Do you want me to repeat his letter, Tina asks? I know it by heart. I don't understand. Do you want to, she asks? No, I suppose I don't want to understand that Ron killed himself because I was wedded to my past experience, to you, to pedagogy, to everything you now dismiss as illusions. Would it really have made any difference if I had known that I could have saved Ron's life by ceasing to be what I was? I didn't answer Tina's question. It was morning when our discussion ended. Tina and Louisa went to work. Sabina and I went to sleep. I got up in time to go to my evening class. We haven't discussed the subject since. Our lives had reverted to normal. I still can't answer Tina's question, can you? It was your letter that gave rise to that systematic dissection of my life's choices. Your letter makes it all sound so simple. In your view, I could have chosen to be a genuine rebel like Ron, and instead I chose to make myself a pedagogue. By choosing what I did, I led Ron to commit suicide. But is it really so simple? Apparently even Ron couldn't put all the blame on me. He tried to blame Tom Matthews for creating the gap between us. He tried to convince himself that if Matthews hadn't tried to shoot me, I would have been delighted to share his individual acts of rebellion while we traveled, stole, and camped. Yet Ron knew perfectly well that my fear of his father wasn't what separated me from Ron. If he placed the blame on Tom Matthews, it was because he knew that the blame lay somewhere outside of me. He knew that I couldn't have gone stealing and camping with him, that our life together would have been a miserable attempt to adapt to the margins of society. He must have known that he didn't kill himself because of me, but because there was no room in the society for someone like Ron. He was a romantic with an unattainable goal. He made me a symbol of the goal. He became aware that he would never reach that goal. That was why he committed suicide. What was his goal? Maybe it was the goal of a genuine rebel. To live freely rejecting the constraints of society. But you know perfectly well that this goal can only be realized by all human beings at once, or by none. It can't be reached by an individual. What you call individual acts of rebellion quickly turn into their opposites. Individual thefts aren't acts of rebellion, but forms of adaptation to private property. If you thought there were more than that, why didn't you steal and hide when you were first released from prison? Why did you look up the sedlax? Why did you get a job? When workers appropriate the productive forces, they don't steal from former owners, but take what's theirs. The former owners are the thieves. By stealing, we accept the legitimacy of the owners, and by fleeing, we accept the legitimacy of the armed force with which they protect their ownership. It's easy to romanticize Ron precisely because he was such a romantic. But the daily reality isn't romantic at all. You wait for your chance and you pounce. That's stimulating because it's a dare, a challenge. If you aren't thrown into jail, it's a victory. Then you wait for another chance. This time, Ron might have to take an enormous risk. Next time, he might have to send me out as a lure. Sabina can tell you all about the chances you take. And at that point, we're right back where we started before we raised the question of rebellion. At that point, we're right back to the students in my community college class. They no longer want to sell themselves as mere workers, namely as low-quality merchandise, and to deal with that problem, they're repairing and painting themselves so as to sell themselves at a higher price. At that point, we're back to George Alberts, whose choice has never entered within my spectrum, whose life I've always regarded as the opposite of what I wanted mine to be. You, Sabina, and Tina have forced me to re-examine my past. I still embrace my own choice. Call it pedagogy if you like, but please don't call it politics. If Mark and Adrian are successful politicians now, it's not because they realize the aspirations we once shared, but because they betrayed those aspirations. I was surprised and disappointed to learn about them. I can't quite believe they were capable of such a turnabout, but you can't use them as proof that every pedagogical rebel aspires to a government post. Of the friends I made on the college newspaper, every single one remained some kind of social outcast and rebel for as long as I kept track of them. At most, you can say we were ludicrous Don Quixotes, that our pens and typewriters were ridiculously inadequate weapons with which to fight the battles we threw ourselves into, but the giants we confronted were real. We tried to cope with some socially meaningful reality. Among the alternatives available to me, 
Only the one I chose enabled me to engage in activity in any way similar to the strike you've just experienced in the plant where I first learned about such activity. Please tell me more about yourself and the exciting events around you and less about me. And do, please, give Yasna my greetings and Luisa's as well. Love, Sophia.